Um, well, hi everyone, um, very happy to be here. My name is Luigi, I, I lead the research and innovation at Earthwatch Europe, uh, we are based uh, in Oxford. <coughs> Let me try to explain why I've traveled 18,000 kilometers to be here today. <laughs> Yeah, um, so um, I've been uh, involved uh, in uh, the equivalent uh, of your uh, association in Europe called EXA uh, for a long time. Uh, till uh, about uh, three years ago, I was the co chair of EXA together with Nikki Ackley, uh, who probably you heard about. And uh, I think that. Uh, um, a good thing of our association is the fact that uh, they are very keen to work together. So I've been always uh, uh, on the outreach part of the association, trying to, to link our activities to your association, to the American Association, and now to the new um, association that are uh, growing in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So. Uh, Again, it's, uh, it's good to be here and it's good when I see people from, from here uh, um, participating in our uh, conference that we do uh, every two years. So another, another reason is that uh, I actually collaborate uh, uh, a lot with uh, some of you. This is a paper that we published, uh, I think, this year uh, about the relation between uh, citizen science and artificial intelligence. And uh, you probably recognize most of uh, the author. Uh, they are uh, all from here, <laughs> apart from myself. So it was a pleasure to, to work uh, with uh, Jesse, Erin, Paul, and the other ones. And uh, finally, as an introduction about what I'm doing, is uh, uh, my coordination of a big project called Mixer, uh, which is probably the largest effort to measure and quantify the impact of citizen science. So this is a platform that is available. Uh, we work uh, uh, more than three years on it. And I really invite, because I, I heard the people talking about impact, and of course we know how important impact is uh, in, in everything and uh, also in citizen science. So I really invite you to visit uh, our platform. There are, you see, two, um, two URLs. So one is the platform where you can uh, uh, upload uh, the data about your project, the metadata about your project. You can describe your project and, uh, and get the results about uh, its impact. But also there is uh, another uh, URL uh, about.mix.2 where you can really find a lot of resources about impact assessment. So everything that uh, you would like to know about impact uh, in citizen science, you will find it there. And you also will find all the questions that we've developed, uh, more than 200 that uh, uh, will help characterize your projects and your impact. So this is uh, just a few screenshots about the platform. You, you will have a kind of graphical interface that uh, will guide you through the different domains uh, uh, on which we calculate uh, impact, uh, um, environment, uh, science, technology, economy, uh, society, etc. You, you will go through this uh, interface, you will be Ask questions, all the questions are closed questions, so don't worry, you don't have to write anything. We already did the work for you. We already know what all the options are, and you just have to choose them. And at the end, uh, you will get uh, recommendations, and you will get a score about uh, the impact of your project. We use uh, uh, both rule-based uh, uh, systems and also machine learning to uh, calculate uh, these results. Okay, so that was the introduction, sorry. <laughs> And uh, let me, let me uh, explain a little bit uh, about uh, our new project uh, that uh, is dedicated to uh, water and ocean literacy in primary and secondary schools uh, using citizen science. So this is a new initiative that uh, is called ProBleu, and uh, I'm keen to, to explain uh, uh, what we are doing and how it could be interesting for you.
So the, the context uh, is uh, a mission about uh, uh, restoring ocean and water by 2030. And uh, as a context, I think that we can agree that uh, uh, if we want to uh, reverse uh, the radicalization of, uh, of the water and the ocean ecosystem, and uh, we, if we want to do this uh, protecting the restoring ecosystem, preventing the humidity, humidity pollution, and making uh, the economy more circular, well, uh, this is something that we share wherever we are. And also, I think that we can agree that uh, in part, this is the success uh, of this mission is uh, uh, related to the fact that we can improve ocean and water literacy. And uh, of course, we, we need to work uh, on, on, the, on the stewardship that uh, is uh, uh, coming out of this uh, increased literacy. Okay, so this is a context that I think can be shared by anyone. Of course, in our case, uh, this context is very specific and this uh, a context uh, that is part uh, of what is called the European Union missions. So this is, uh, a, of course, a very complex uh, a environment in which we, we, we need to work. I, if you can see, uh, there is a budget that is uh, uh, translated in uh, your dollars is uh, about half a billion dollars. And, uh, and of course, it needs to be complex. To, they need to justify uh, that they are spending so many millions uh, on, on this mission. And uh, we, we could grab a few of these millions uh, in, this, uh, in this project, and uh, I will explain you how we are going to spend them. So if we go back to, to uh, the context, uh, uh, we, we focus on, on this. So uh, the project is about increasing ocean and water literacy, meaning uh, uh, everything uh, educational related to water. It can be fresh water, it can be marine water, any kind of water. And uh, we have 1.3 million to distribute to schools. So this is a special case because usually, uh, as everyone, we need money. In this case, <laughs> we are giving away money. So it's, uh, it's a special case that schools, of course, need to, need to take advantage of. But also, we have uh, a duty to disseminate as much as possible, uh, let's say, the, the conditions and uh, the, the availability of this funding so that they can apply uh, in a way in which the money flows towards the schools that mostly need them and not just the ones that are already in the loop and then more easily can access this kind of information. So this is our typical funding context. So this is uh, the area where we, we can uh, distribute the money usually. But this year there was, uh, there was uh, new things that uh, happened uh, unexpectedly and uh, this changed and <laughs> now New Zealand also is, uh, is uh, uh, eligible because uh, the European Union has a bunch of uh, so-called associated countries and this year New Zealand became an associated country. I never understood why and how but uh, it happened. So I said well uh, then uh, because there was the opportunity and the funding for me to be here, I said, well, let's travel to the Sunshine Coast. Probably if I have to say something, is uh, more, uh, is easier for me to be listened, to be heard from uh, uh, New Zealand, from here, than from Europe. And uh, so that's why I'm happy to see that there are a few New Zealanders here. And, uh, and I hope that in the future, when we will be able to distribute this money also to New Zealand, which is not yet the case, but it will be soon, I hope that there will be many applications coming from uh, this side uh, of the globe. Anyway, uh, I know that we are not in New Zealand, so don't worry. <laughs> so let's say that uh, uh, these are the objectives of, uh, of the project, but uh, uh, they are nothing really special in the sense that at the end, what we want, as I said before, is to facilitate the way for schools to uh, create uh, new or improved projects about uh, water literacy. And uh, in particular, to do it uh, with citizen science in mind. So we designed the project so that these new activities, these new projects 
should have or they are facilitated in having citizen science elements in them because we wanted to do that. It was not one of the conditions, but uh, let's say because uh, we lead the project and we uh, know the importance of citizen science, we wanted to, to give this particular thought to the project. As I said, uh, um, there will be calls for project uh, where the schools uh, uh, can apply to. And uh, as I said, in the future, New Zealand will be able uh, to participate. The funny thing related to what we uh, heard before is that uh, even if it, this is public money, this is money coming from the European, from the European Union, we are, we are finding that <laughs> it's much more difficult for public schools to participate than private schools. And this is completely absurd, but the fact is that the schools need to, to sign a contract with us. <coughs> Uh, for a public school, many times it's difficult to send a contract because public schools uh, in many counties are kind of owned by the government and uh, the, the chain of command uh, is very large and undefined and at the end nobody knows who can sign these contracts. While in a private school it's much more clear uh, who has the, the right to sign this contract. We need to resolve this because uh, uh, it's not good, but it's something that is happening. And uh, what about Australia? So uh, the distribution of funding is not the only thing that we do. We are producing uh, also a lot of resources that will be available for all the schools everywhere. And uh, I was very proud uh, of things that I wanted to say, but then I've seen the, the work of uh, uh, learning by doing, and I said, wow, <laughs> uh, well, Maybe, maybe you have something that is very good, uh, much closer to, to you, uh, uh, developed by the University of Sydney. And actually, I think that uh, uh, we have a lot to learn uh, from them. And uh, I hope that in the future we can collaborate because uh, in part we will be doing similar things. Of course, our context is different. The curriculum is completely different. Also, we work uh, in 45 countries with 40 languages, with 45 different educational systems. So you can understand how difficult it can be to, to really just reach out. I mean, we have to translate every message, every uh, document that we produce in 40 languages. Nobody knows all these languages. We need to uh, sometimes understand uh, things through automatic translation. So the context of a multilingual uh, uh, continent uh, like Europe is, uh, is tricky, but uh, this cannot be a barrier. We, we need to reach out to the 300,000 uh, schools that we have, and uh, we will try to do that. So yeah, uh, there are just a, a few examples of the kind of resources, and I'm uh, finishing. Um, again, citizen science tools as the uh, primary uh, kind of resources that we will uh, not only develop, but uh, make accessible and available. There are already a lot of things that are there. We just want them to be very accessible to schools. We, we don't want to reinvent things that are already there. We want to have, uh, and we are working on it, on uh, direct, uh, sometimes uh, real-time interaction with scientists, especially scientists working on research vessels. So we have uh, a part of the budget that is dedicated to that. And also we will be developing uh, a gaming platform where people can uh, work on different scenarios. They can simulate. Uh, different things uh, and uh, so they can, the students can understand uh, the difference of uh, uh, different routes that can be taken by decision makers. And that was all, thank you. Thank you Luigi, that, that was so interesting and um, I feel like Australia needs to sort of cozy on up to you a little bit more because um, it, it would be wonderful to have uh, access to all those opportunities. Um, do we have some questions? Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I was just wondering if you currently or intend to collaborate with Australia and New Zealand fish production researchers? Um, not specifically. Uh, Would you like to? <laughs> but... Uh, uh, let's say if if there is a link that we can make uh, to citizen science uh, and uh, 
of course, uh, I understand that this would be related to sustainable fishing uh, and not just an increase in production. Yeah, um, yeah that, that, would be, that would be possible and interesting, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I don't know if you were present, but there was a really great presentation on plastics pollution and some statistics that I, I, I found mind-boggling, which is that the majority of those um, plastics uh, islands come from six rivers in, in the world. Um, so how does Pro Blue actually... Um, you know, balance the, obviously, the efficiency of dealing with an English speaking or a, um, a, you know, society like Australia and New Zealand where you can get into the schools and do these programs with actually the need, which is actually in those six river areas where there are probably not so much education and not so many organised schools, but they're clearly they are the bigger problem. Is that something that you've, um, you're a global operation, has it yeah. been thought of that? Well, let's say that uh, uh, ProBlue is still uh, a, an effort uh, coming from the Global North uh, for the Global North. So that's, that's clear. Uh, if you see if you see the map uh, I show you at the beginning, uh, we, we are not talking about uh, the areas where these uh, six rivers uh, are. Uh, I don't remember exactly where they were, but definitely they were not in Europe. And uh, so let's say that I, I really sympathize uh, with the fact that uh, we need to work more in the Global South, where uh, our, our most pressing environmental challenges are. And uh, ProBlue is not part uh, of the solution directly. We want to, let's say, we want to increase uh, the literacy in the sense that we want uh, uh, students to be aware of that, but directly we are not really touching the origins of these uh, pollutions, as you mentioned. It is true that uh, uh, we are trying to do that as Earthwatch. So as Earthwatch Europe now, we are trying to expand uh, uh, our uh, work uh, into Africa precisely because that's a place where uh, there are uh, uh, biggest challenges, uh, biggest environmental challenges with respect to Europe. So we try to, to move our budget, to move our resources towards parts of the world where the, the, the biggest challenges are. But it's not easy. It's not easy especially because the funding sources are located uh, uh, where they are and uh, sometimes it's not easy to, to divert uh, you know, for example, European funding into other areas. Hi, Luigi. Um, I have already said I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher of marine science and aquatic practices. And so <coughs> the, in a Queensland, there's Marine Teachers Association um, who would probably, those teachers would be very interested in the ocean projects. Um, so one, I can put you in touch with the Marine Teachers Association, which will um, get to the teachers. But I was wondering whether the project can work the other way, that the citizen science project can, uh, like, approach teachers or so and um, apply for funding kind of together rather than, because it's probably more difficult or to get the information to the teachers, if you understand what I mean? Sorry. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you because uh, yesterday when we were talking about your experience on the research vessel, you were an inspiration for things that uh, we will be doing. About uh, applying for funding, uh, in, in this particular case, uh, the, the rules uh, say that uh, it's a school that has to apply for funding cannot be together with somebody else. Uh, there, there are other things, uh, there is twinning, there are other things, but at the end uh, it needs to be a school. And this is difficult because sometimes uh, when you put 
more than one organization or schools and researchers together, things would be easier. But you know, th there are restrictions for for every uh, type of funding. In this case, is rather restricted the, the way in which uh, people can apply. Still, as I said, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of schools, so we hope that <laughs> we find enough to, to to be able to to find them. At the end, uh, 1.3 million are not a lot of money, so they they will finish pretty soon. <laughs> One more question, thank you. Might be an easy one, Richard. <laughs> I just noticed um, in your Pro Blue goals, one of the dot points was to change environmental education. I just wondered if you could elaborate on why that was identified as a goal and what the yeah. change yeah, I, I said change because we don't want to have a revolution. So we, we want to, to change it in the sense that we want to add uh, more elements to the existing curriculum, uh, more elements related to water literacy. So it's, uh, if you want, uh, a slight change in the direction of having more citizen science uh, related to water in uh, a situation that is not, it's not changing something that is bad. It's just improving slightly, or in some cases mm, less than slightly, uh, the, the environmental education that we have. So it was not uh, it was not a bad thing uh, what we have now. One more. Um, programs that have been around in Australia, like Streamwatch and Waterwatch that are pre-existing uh, water quality citizen science programs, but we're all struggling for funding to keep our programs afloat. Um, and so instead of recreating something and giving a new one in to repeat, um, already working off programs that have been developed over 20 years that are sitting on really good data sets already with kids. Yeah, so as I said, uh, um, first of all, we will not be working in Australia, but in general, uh, this is a, is, a, is a very good point. So we will not develop new things uh, that are competing with existing things. We will just uh, uh, collect uh, knowledge about what is out there and we will make it more accessible and easy to use uh, to uh, schools. And we cannot fund uh, these uh, initiatives in any case. So we, we just can't fund schools. Not could be a good idea to find existing citizen science programs, but that's not uh, the idea for this project. Thank you so much. And keep um, plugging away at those public schools that are EGB, the ones that need you. Um, so I encourage you. It's hard work, but keep it up. Thank you so much for your presentation. We really loved it.